This is the first of two videos talking about section 5.3. In this video, I'll be talking about area functions. So we've already talked about the definite integral, which is an expression that represents the area bounded between the function graph and the x-axis from a starting point x equals a to an ending point x equals b. What's an area function, though? Well, what we're talking about is taking the upper bound of that integral. So rather than integrating from a to b, we're going to integrate from a to x. So you might be thinking, well, what's the big deal? You just changed the name of that letter. Well, if we're thinking of the upper bound as a variable, we're thinking of this upper bound as being able to move around. So if I move that x to the left, I don't have as much area. So if x is over here, then that's a smaller shape and I don't have as much area. If I move my x over here, then that's a larger shape and I have more area. So we're thinking of it as a function where the variable is the stopping point, the upper bound of that function. So as an example, let's say we've got the function f of t equals 2t plus 3, and we want to find a formula for the area function a of x equals the integral from 2 to x of f of t dt. So you might be wondering about the use of the letter t here. The idea is that we don't want to get ourselves confused between the horizontal axis, which we normally call x, and the actual variable that's talking about the ending point of this integral. So we sort of normally call both of those things x, but that would be confusing. So instead, we're going to change our horizontal axis to be called t. But everything else is really going to stay the same as problems that we've done before. So I'm going to graph the line y equals 2t plus 3, which looks a lot like 2x plus 3. So y equals 2t plus 3 looks like that. It's got y-intercept 3 and slope 2. I know that doesn't quite look like a slope 2 line, but just the way that I've drawn my scale, I want to make it a little easier to see what's going on here. Here's my starting point, x, or t equals 2, and then my ending point is t equals x. So the idea here is that I'm still looking for the area of this shape. So this is similar to area problems that we've done before. I still want the area of that shape, but now some of the dimensions are going to depend on x because I don't exactly know where that x is located. So for example, this horizontal distance, the distance from 2 to x, the way we find the, the distance between two numbers on our number line is to subtract them. So that distance is actually x minus 2. So this point up here, that's the point on my line when I plug in t equals 2. So that's going to be the point 2 comma 7. That's what I get when I plug 2 into that formula. And then this is going to be the point x comma 2x plus 3, because that's what I get when I plug x in for t. All right. So we've done similar problems like this before. We're going to think of this as a triangle sitting on top of a rectangle. So what's the area of this rectangle? Well, this height is 7, and the base is x minus 2. So area equals base times height. That's going to be 7 times x minus 2. And then this triangle up here, the area there is going to be 1 half base times height. The base is also x minus 2. And then what's the height? Well, this vertical distance is going to be, well, this distance is 7. We saw that before. The entire distance all the way up to that point is 2x minus 3. So this distance here is 2x plus 3 minus 7. That's 2x minus 4. Right, Because we went all the way up to that point from the t-axis, the distance would be 2x plus 3. We only want to go from that red horizontal dotted line that I've drawn, so we have to subtract the 7. So now our area would be we don't have to simplify this, nothing in the problem tells us to. So the area would be the area of the rectangle, 7 times x minus 2, plus the area 1 half times x minus 2 times 2x minus 4. But I actually do want to simplify this because I want us to notice something. So we're going to get 7x minus 14. This is going to be 1 half. If I FOIL that out, I'm going to get 2x squared minus 8x plus 8. Multiply through by that 1 half x squared minus 4x plus 4. So I've got x squared, 7x minus 4x, that's plus 3x, and then negative 14 plus 4, that's minus 10. So that's my area function simplified. Okay, so what might we notice here? Well, we started with the function 2t plus 3, which again we're thinking is not really being that much different from 2x plus 3. We're just changing it to t to avoid confusion. And then what we ended up with was x squared plus 3x minus 10. And what you might notice is that if we took an antiderivative of 2x plus 3, we talked about those a little while back, that's going to give us x squared plus 3x plus a constant. 
And so you might notice that there's actually some connection there. And in fact, we used the integral sign to represent antiderivatives, and we've been using the integral sign to represent areas. So maybe there is, in fact, a strong connection between those two ideas. And it turns out that's true. So what we have and what we're sort of seeing a little bit here is what we call the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, which is that given a function, the area function is an antiderivative of that function. So what I'm saying here is just saying this symbolically. So this is the derivative of the area function. And this is just me saying the derivative of the area function in a different way. And this is me saying the derivative function, the derivative of the area function again in a different way, putting in that integral there. And then all we're saying is that that equals the original function. So these are just three different ways to say the derivative of the area function, written three different ways, is equal sign f of x, the original function. So that's a pretty important statement, a pretty important thing that relates the original derivative problem that we started out talking about at the beginning of the semester to this new area problem that we've been talking about lately. And we're going to delve into why this fundamental theorem of calculus is true. And me saying part one makes you think that maybe there's a part two. We'll talk about that in the next video.